welcome on easy learning today we are going to start the new chapter it is how free is the press written by Dorothy L Sayers as usual in this part of the video I will only read with correct pronunciation as much as it is possible and you should do the same as many times as possible you should also try to share this video to others whose pronunciation skill and reading skill is very weak and this video can help them a lot I hope after reading this chapter it will help you a lot so without wasting the time now I am going to read each and every word of uh, this chapter that is related to a chapter and uh, I will try to pronounce them as much as possible at first I will read about the author and then the chapter how free is the press Dorothy L Sayers about the author Dorothy Lake Sayers was born in 1893 and died in 1957 was an essayist playwright poet and writer of detective fiction was educated at Somerville College Oxford in 1915 Sayers became one of the first women to graduate from Oxford University her published works include clouds of witness a natural death Lord Peter views the body nine tellers God unite she has added great short stories of detection and published a competent worst translation of inferno in the essay how free is the press she writes with clarity of thought to make a strong case against misreporting by the press or against the misuse of the freedom of the press How free is the press? That without a free press there can be no free people is a thing that all free people take for granted. We need not discuss it, nor will we at this moment discuss the restrictions placed upon the press in time of war. At such times, all liberties have to be restricted. Free people must see to it that when peace comes, full freedom is restored in the meantime it may be wholesome to consider what that freedom is and how far it is truly desirable it may turn out to be no freedom at all or even a mere freedom to tyrannies for tyranny is in fact the uncontrolled freedom of one man or one gang to impose its will on the world when we speak of the freedom of the press, we usually mean freedom in a very technical and restricted sense, namely freedom from direction or censorship by the government. In this respect, the British press is under ordinary conditions singularly free. It can attack the policy and political character of ministers, interfere in the delicate machinery of foreign diplomacy conduct campaigns to subvert the constitution incite citizens to discontent and rebellion expose scandals and foment grievances and generally harry and belabor the servants of the state with almost perfect liberty on occasion it can become a weapon to coerce the government to conform to what it asserts to be the will of the people So far, this is all to be the good. Occasionally, this freedom may produce disastrous hesitations and inconsistencies in public policy or tend to hamper the swift execution of emergency measures. But generally speaking, it works to secure and sustain that central doctrine of democracy as we understand it, that the state is not the master but the servant of the people 
The press as a whole and in this technical and restricted sense is thus pretty free in a peaceful Britain. There is no shade of political opinion that does not somehow contrive to express itself. But if you go on to imagine that any particular organ of the press enjoys the larger liberty of being a forum of public opinion, we are gravely mistaken. Every newspaper is shackled to its own set of our lords, and in its turns, like the unmerciful servant, exercises a powerful boundaries upon its readers and on the public generally. Indeed, we may say that the heaviest restriction upon the freedom of public opinion is not the official censorship of the press, but the unofficial censorship by the press which exists not so much to express opinion as to manufacture it. The editorial policy of a popular daily is controlled by two chief factors. The first is the interest of the advertisers from whom it gets the money which enables it to keep up its large circulation. No widely circulated newspaper dare support a public policy, however, much in the national interest that might conflict with the vested interests of its advertisers. Thus, any proposal to control the marketing of branded goods, as for example of margarine in 1939, will be violently opposed on the loftiest hygienic grounds by the papers that carry the branded advertising. On the other hand, any product that refuses to pay the high advertising rates of a powerful national organ will be, again on the highest moral and hygienic sounds, denounced, smashed and driven off the market, yet you are not allowed to use any product that dissociates itself from the advertising ring. All this is understandable since a big circulation spells bankruptcy. If the paper has to depend on its sales for its revenue, every newspaper lives in a perpetual precarious balance. It must increase its sales to justify its advertising rates and to increase its sales. It must sell itself far below the cost of production. But if it sells more copies, then its advertising will pay for it faces financial disaster. Consequently, the more widespread and powerful the organ, the more closely it has to subverse vested interests. This means that the chief daily paper, which goes everywhere and has most influence, is far less free than the more expensive weekly or monthly, which draws a higher proportion of its revenue from sales. Therefore, it is only the comparatively rich who can afford to reward independent expressions of opinion. The second chief source of a newspaper's revenue is the wealth of the man or company that owns it. Accordingly, its policy is largely determined by the personal spites and political ambitions of its proprietor. The failure, for example, of a great newspaper magnet to secure a government appointment may be the signal for the unleashing of a virulent campaign in every organ which he controls against the minister or the party which has disappointed his ambitions. The public, knowing nothing of the personal bias behind the attack, and little of the vast network of control which ties up whole groups of the London and provincial press in the hands of a single man or combine, sees only that great number of what appear to him to be independent organs are united in a single service and persistent condemnation. Unless he is exceptionally shrewd, exceptionally cynical, or of exceptionally resolute and independent mind, he can scarcely help being influenced and having his vote influenced and its 
odds that he will never realize the nature of the pressure brought to bear upon him. But still more serious because more subtle than the control applied to individual papers by various kinds of interest is the control and censorship exercised by the press upon the news and opinions which it disseminates. The control rests upon and exploits two basic assumptions about the public. A. That they have not the wit to distinguish truth from falsehood. B. That they do not care at all that a statement is false, provided it is titillating. Neither assumption is flattering and indeed between the language used privately by the late Lord Northcliffe about his British readers and language used publicly by Hitler about his German readers, there is very little to choose. Both assume that readers can, made, can be made to believe anything. The result is that accurate reporting, which used to be the pride of the old-fashioned independent newspapers, has largely given place to reporting, which is at best slipshod and at worst tendentious. I should like to illustrate with quite trivial examples drawn from personal experiences the various ways by which both fact and opinion can be distorted so that a kind of a smear of unreality is spread over the whole newspaper piece. From reports of public affairs down to the most casual items of daily gossip. I. Sensational headlines. It is first sensational headlines, false emphasis and suppression of context. This year 1941 at the Mayward Conference, I read a paper dealing with the theological grounds for the church concerned with politics and sociology, with the complementary dangers of pietism and sigerism, and with the importance of incarnation doctrine in this connection. Out of 8,000 words, some 250 dealt with the connection between Caesarism and an undue emphasis placed on sexual as contrasted with financial morality. This quite subsidiary paragraph was reported everywhere under sensational headlines in such a manner as to convey that this passing allusion formed the whole subject matter of my address out of the 8,000 words about theology, the reporters picked the only one which they presumed their readers capable of understanding to wit for negation. You, the reader, will appreciate the compliment. I will, however, add for your comfort that this report was not made, as you might well suppose, by a pressman from your favorite paper especially selected for his understanding of ecclesiastical affairs. All the distorted reports emanated from a news agency and the individual editors, when remonstrated with, were for the most part content to disavow responsibility. This is how you learn what happens at public meetings. Second, garbling. This is the special accomplishment of the press interviewer. During the production of my latest play, I was asked what were my plans for the future. I replied that I never made plans, that I preferred writing plays to novels, though novels paid better, and that financial consideration notwithstanding, if the opportunity to write a play were to present itself, for example, another commission for the Canterbury Festival. I should undoubtedly write it. This reply duly appeared in the press in the form. Miss Sayers said she would write to more plays except on commission. 
blend perversions of this kind together with the interviews playful habit of making a statement himself and attributing them to his victim make reported interviews singularly unreliable reading one must allow for the pressman's vivid imagination i remember reading with interest that my eyes glitter behind my glasses when making some remark or other since that particular interview was given by telephone I could only conclude that the interviewer's own eyes must have been double magnifying glass microscope of extra power. But the last best word on press interview has been written by Q in from a Cornish window. Those who believe that public child character say everything they are reported as saying should read it and take warning. In accurate reporting of facts, some time ago, a daily paper reported that my flat had been broken into the previous day. Some time ago, a daily paper reported that my said Oxford in time to disturb the thieves. Once again, correction. In accurate report, reporting of fact, some time ago, a daily paper reported that my flat had been broken into the previous day and that I had returned from, I think they said, Oxford, in time to disturb the thieves. This was true enough, except that every detail was wrong. The date was three days earlier than alleged. I was not at Oxford, but at the King's garden party and the intruders had been disturbed not by me but most likely by the newspaper boy the interest here lies in the probable reason for the misstatements that did had to be changed to conceal the fact that the news was already cold and i was substituted for the boy presumably for a greater snob value the altered it was a bad blunder buckingham palace would have adorned the tale to so much better advantage. Plain reversal of the facts. On a summons for unshaded lights, a letter of mine was read to the bench explaining that my servant had carefully drawn the curtains, but that there had proved, unfortunately, to be a defect in the curtains themselves. The local paper duly reported. Miss Sayers said that a servant had forgotten to draw the curtains. This was calculated to cause pain and distress to my servant. But why should anybody care? Random and gratuitous invention. Without consulting me at all, a small And gossipy paper recently informed its readers that two of my favorite hobbies were gardening and keeping cats. I do not see why anybody should want to know my hobbies. But if they do it, it would surely be better to mention the right ones. The choice was peculiarly unfortunate. If there is anything I detest, it is gardening. And although my household always includes a necessary cat, which lives in the kitchen and is supposed to catch mice, I have little to do with it except to remove it and its hairs from the chairs and cushions and open the drawer for it from time to time under protest. Shortest of domestic staff has since constrained me to live on more intimate terms with the cat. But if he is a hobby, then so are the handyman and the daily woman. Deliberate miracle mongering. It was recently reported in various local papers that in a public address it had delivered some 20,000 words in the space of an hour and a quarter. This would in any case have been impossible. Actually, the reporter had 
the full text of my speech in his hands and could have seen for himself that it consisted of almost exactly 8,000 words. The error was thus precisely 150% a useful figure on which to base one's estimate of truth in reporting. Of the six forms of misrepresentation, the first two are the most dangerous. There is no remedy against them. They do not come within the narrow range of the law of libel. For to misrepresent a man's attitude and opinion is not offense. No good, nor could one readily persuade a jury that a lie had been told about one since a sort of formal veracity in detail is used to cover a totally false impression of the speaker's words as a whole. Consequently, it is next door to impossible to secure either corrections or apology, which brings us to flat separation. Letters to protest may be written, these may be ignored, printed in full or in part, accompanied by an editorial comment to the effect that the words reported were actually said and that the speaker must not expect to monopolize the whole of the paper's valuable space answered privately by the editor a maneuver that does nothing to correct the false impressions left in the public mind only occasionally and usually from a provincial paper does one receive full apology and correction let me quote Andres Kosa a note written to me from an editor of the older school. Thank you for your letter, which we thought it our duty to print. We try to preserve our reputation for balanced news. Here are three old-fashioned words, duty, reputation, balanced. Do they still represent what the reader demands or expects from Fleet Street? To get Misleading statements corrected entails, in any case, a heavy and exhausting effort of correspondence, for the falsehood may be syndicated all over the walls, overnight and appear simultaneously in several hundred papers. In addition, if one makes a fuss or ventures to accuse the newspapers of lack of veracity, there always lurks in the background the shadow of genteel blackmail. Any public person, writer, speaker, actor, politician is subtly made to feel that if he offends the press, he will suffer for it. No threat, of course, is openly uttered, but looks and plays may be unfavorably noticed or silently ignored, allusions sneering. Though not actually levelless, may crop up in the gossip columns. A thousand hints will be quietly conveyed that the press can make or break reputations. The books which venture to criticize the press are therefore rare, nor is it easy to find a paper honest enough to print an article on the subject. As speeches may be made, of course, but they will not reach the wider public, for they will not be reported in full. Only a carefully isolated sentence or so will fund its well way into the papers under some such headline as Bishop seeks to muzzle press or MP attacks press liberty. Indeed, the slightest effort to hinder the irresponsible dissemination of nonsense is greeted by a concerted hall. This is a threat to the freedom of the press. No wonder that within three days lately the Archbishop of York and the Minister of the Crown were hard to utter the same despairing cry in face of journalistic mis misrepresentation and indiscretion. We cannot control the press. The particular examples I had given are, you will say, of very small importance, true. That is what makes them too symptomatic and so disquieting. They do not show any direct resting of the truth towards a propagandist and against such attempts the reader may, with a little mental effort, efficiently arm himself. 
what they do clearly show is an all-pervading carelessness about veracity, penetrating every column, creeping into the most trifling item of news, smudging and blurring the boundary lines between fact and fancy, creating a general atmosphere of cynicism and mistrust. He that is unfaithful in little is unfaithful also in much. If a common cold case cannot be correctly reported, how are we to believe the reports of world events? If an interviewer misinterprets the novelist to whom we have all seen, where does he do with a foreign statement whom we have never seen? If the papers can be convicted of false emphasis garbling in accuracy reversal of the fact random invention miracle mongering and flat separation in cases where such distortions are of it and when it is to nobody what are we to suppose about those cases in which vested interests are closely connected and above all what are we to make of the assumptions on which all this is best that the speaker that the reader is too stupid to detect falsehood and too frivolous to even resent it dissent journalists do not like the present state of affairs nor do the more responsible editors but the number of editors and journalists who can maintain a high standards of duty, balance and reputation in the face of pressure grows less day by day. It is difficult for any paper that presents its news soberly to maintain its circulation. Perhaps it is true that every nation gets the press it deserves. But supposing the reader does care about the accuracy? Does he resent contempt for his intelligence? Does he want the truth what is said and done? What steps is he to take? How is he to get at the facts which are withheld or smothered under these mountains of distortion and absurdity? How is he to make his will felt? Is he to write angry letters or transfer his daily penny from one organ to another? Will anybody care if he does. They will care if he protests in sufficient numbers, but his penny is a small weapon to oppose against the vested interests and the pulled money of the great combines. His helplessness is a measure of the freedom which the press enjoys, but is the reader free? The common has a vote in parliament. He has a parliamentary representative whom he can bezer and heckle and whose tenure of office rests upon his consent. If he likes to make use of the machinery of a democracy, he can have questions asked in the house in the last resort. He can destroy one government and make another, but there is no machinery by which he can control the organs which mould opinion. For that, his sole resource is a penny a day and this native wit and will in time of crisis the newspapers are first with the cry let the people know the facts but perhaps fact is the deity invoked by the people only in the last emergency when the easy gods of peace have filled them with this i have covered the reading from next part of the videos i will explain them from part to part and from paragraph to paragraph thank you Try to share it with those friends who are in the need of ours.